What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to episode 13, lucky 13 right after Halloween of the Next Man Up Injury Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Allen, and I'm back with the dynamic duo, as always, of Matthew Walters and Eric Crail. Matthew, how are you doing this evening? Doing quite well. Football's over at the high school I work at, so I actually get to be home before dark some days, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, it's definitely a good good thing when you can turn that around it's the time of coming on the time of year for me as a nurse excuse me as a nurse working at the hospital where i come in in the dark and i leave in the dark so the light of day is always a welcome sight for me eric how are you sir how's it going fellas i'm doing great i was a carrot for halloween and that's always a fan favorite the public demands it hey I love it. Love to see it. Great vision. You're the only one of us not wearing glasses. So I'm just assuming that it worked for you. That's right. All righty. Well, we've reached a point in the season where players have built a solid body of work. We kind of know what to expect from them and it's worth reflecting upon them. So let's talk about some rookies. Eric, I'll go to you first. If you had to pick a top three dynasty rookies looking at the resumes just this year, who would you take? Would you change any of your preseason predictions? I mean, it would be league dependent, but I think Jamar Chase, you could easily take over a couple of the quarterbacks that were taken early and often. Um, Kyle Pitts would also be understandably 1.02, if not 1.01, depending on the structure of your league. Um, I'm not too certain that I would be taking Najee Harris as high as he went, Um, but given the rest of the class, I think that's fine. I'm a little skeptical on Zach Wilson. I'm still in on Zach Wilson, but you know, I'm not so certain that uh, he's currently living up to the hype, especially for a rookie. Not sure if he's going to be the one for New York, but he could be a placeholder for the next guy. We'll see. Matthew, you had some hot takes in the preseason for your rookies, or maybe not some not so hot takes, some takes coming true. Would you change anything that you said in the preseason about the rookies this season? I would probably have Jalen Waddle a little higher. I was kind of low on him coming out. I would like to say I was spot on, it looks like, with Trey Sermon. I was off him from the very beginning and got roasted for it early and often about it. And it feels very good that he is doing nothing this year. So, Yeah, you hate to see it for the guy, but I know for you it's like, Makes you feel good to be like that, right? About somebody. Like, yeah, I planted, I planted my flag on this. I'm gonna victory lap on it. Feels yeah. good to be. Yeah, n- nothing against Trey Sermon. I'm sure he's a great guy, but I just didn't think he was good at football. And so far, it's looking like that's coming to fruition. And speaking of feeling good, how about Devonte Smith and the BMI argument? Glad to see that one away hey, quickly. He hasn't gotten hurt. <laughs> hey, not. Knock on wood. We haven't had to talk about him on this podcast yet. And that is a good thing when people are worried about your health. Well, Halloween is behind us now, but we certainly saw some players go down this week that made a scream. But don't be scared. We're here to help you find who to replace them with, how to get ready for that playoff push. Here at the Next Man Up, we have a saying that the best ability is availability. And as you know, a player on your injured reserve can't really help your fantasy team and can't score you any points, quite frankly. So we're here to help you find out not only how long they'll be out, but who you can replace them with. So without further ado, let's get to it, gentlemen. For the sake of organization, we'll split the news up by position. Get things rolling. Let's talk about the signal signal callers, the QBs. Kicking it off in Arizona with Kyler Murray. Matthew, he suffered an ankle injury, but stayed in the game. Um, I believe it was in the fourth quarter. I noticed him like limping around right there on that last drive, and it was Kind of concerning as somebody that has a lot of Kyler Murray in my leagues. Uh, What's going on there with his ankle and what can we expect? Yeah, so late in the game, like you said, he injured his ankle. They haven't really come out with a whole lot of information about it. They've just kind of said, oh, you know, we got to see how he feels and go, go from there. But I did see a report that it's actually on the medial side of his ankle, which for those unfamiliar, that's more of the deltoid ligament region and not really a traditional ankle sprain 
So him finishing out the game was a good sign. I wouldn't be surprised if he's kind of limited early in the week. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays this weekend. I'm I'm not overly concerned. However, his running upside is what concerns me now. He's a very mobile QB, and I'm afraid he might, if this is kind of a lingering issue going forward, might not run quite as much as he has in the past, which similar to last year when he injured his shoulder and stopped stopped running quite as much because he wasn't wanting to take those hits, could see something similar to that happen. Yeah, it'll be something to watch for sure this week to see if he's available, but Something I'm more looking at if I have him is worrying about if he is available. So the next man up for Arizona is Colt McCoy, which uh, it's not super inspiring for fantasy. Yeah, it's not bad. I all but guarantee he's going to be available in your waiver wire and you probably won't have to put down very much for him, if anything, out of your fab bank. Um, In a super flex, you could do worse. Yeah, in a super flex, you could definitely do worse. But look on your waiver wire if... Some team in your league doesn't already have Mike White, the NFL's leading passer last week. You might be able to scoop him up and get a solid spot start out of him. Yeah, he's got a Thursday night game this week, so we'll see. Um, In Carolina, Sam Darnold suffered a concussion. I actually didn't catch this during gameplay this week, but when I was going back through the injury reports, I saw it. Eric, obviously we talk about concussions as nonlinear energy injuries. Have we heard anything about Sam Darnold and his status for this week? Uh, it's, I mean, I don't think it looks very good for him. Unfortunately, it, it's so up in the air with any sort of concussion injury. But if you watch the tape and the actual injury, it was a nasty hit against the Falcons. And I mean, with any concussion injury, especially in sports, you can technically suffer two brain bruises with the same hit. It's called coup, counter coup. You know, the first bruise or injury would occur when the body is suddenly stopped on impact. And then the second is when the head would, would essentially whiplash. And, you know, watching the video, he definitely got coop counter coop i mean it was bad so you never know what's going to happen um i think it's worth mentioning that sam Darnold wasn't particularly playing well prior to this i think in his last four weeks he had had something around 200 yards a game two touchdowns five interceptions um so you know it's possible that the team is you know prepared to rest him a little extra let yeah. pj walker step up to the plate he's a bit more dynamic on his feet um but i i really wouldn't expect sam Darnold to come back you know this week especially but probably Probably not next week either. Yeah, he kicked off the year with a pretty good start, and then he's kind of returned to form of late. As you mentioned, PJ Walker is the next man up for Carolina, and he's an intriguing one for me because, you know, we saw his body of work in the XFL for those of us that were big XFL believers. Um, and he was the star of that league. He was great. He showed that he could pass well, he did a little bit with his legs. If he's available in my league, especially if I'm a Sam Darnold manager, I'm going to pick him up and feel fairly confident starting him. I mean, Carolina's got some good options. We're going to talk about Christian McCaffrey's availability coming up um, shortly when we talk about running backs. But as far as receiving cores go, goes, Carolina's isn't awful, and P.J. Walker's a competent passer. If, if you got to put somebody in your super flex spot, I don't hate P.J. Walker this week. Yeah, he reminds me like a lesser Jalen Hurts where you're not too amazed by his arm skills, but because of his Konami code ability, I mean, he might score you some decent fantasy points. Yeah, and he's probably starts less argument or gets less argument started about him on Twitter as well. So that's always a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Speaking of quarterbacks that have a little bit of mobility, Dak Prescott has been dealing with a calf injury, Matthew. We saw Cooper Cup start for him last week. It was kind of a last minute decision. Cooper Does Cup that, did? Excuse me, Cooper Rush. Cooper, If you started <laughs> Cooper Cup in your super flex, you wouldn't be mad. But um, no. Cooper Rush, thank you for catching that. <laughs> Here I go, but, butchering <laughs> Dallas names to the Cowboys fan. Yeah, so tell me about Dak Prescott. What's his outlook this week? So his outlook's looking really good this week. There's a lot of people that thought he was going to play last week. He went through pregame warmups. I think uh, it was Collinsworth on the broadcast even said, I, I watched him and thought he was going to play. But it uh, seems Dallas was taking the long-term approach, which is definitely smart when you're now a 6-1 and one team and you're hoping to make a playoff push this year. You don't want to re-aggravate that injury and it turned into a long-term problem. So they elected to go with uh, 
Cooper Rush, who balled out and won the game. So we got two MVPs on the team, apparently, at QB. But no, um, I think all reports are saying Dak's going to practice full by Thursday. So keep an eye out for that. Now, of course, Jerry Jones is saying Dak's for sure playing this week. But that's also Jerry Jones. You take everything he says with a grain of salt. So we'll just kind of have to see. But I imagine he's going to play this week. Yeah, if Jerry Jones and Pete Carroll ran a clinic together, I think every single patient would leave with minimal treatment and they'd just be like running again on broken femurs. Those guys are just like, oh, yeah, he's playing. It's like, did you even look at the injury report? I don't know. But his foot's facing the to, wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure last year he said Dak would play the week after he broke his foot off his body. No, all jokes aside, Cooper Rush, if Dak is unavailable to go, I'm comfortable starting Cooper Rush. Um, maybe would tamper expectations a little bit from what he did last week, but with a full week to prepare, knowing he's going to be the starter, he could produce the same again. I wouldn't be upset with 15 points. Kyle, the backup. Cooper Rush, PJ Walker, Colt McCoy. Who would you prefer? Colt McCoy last for sure. <laughs> I'd pr- I would feel most comfortable with Cooper Rush because I saw what he could do last week. Um, but if I was like, I'm desperate, I need a home run possibility. I'm going to go with PJ Walker because of his upside with the legs. Okay. All right. So Jameis Winston in New Orleans. Obviously, the reports have come out. They've said that he has a torn ACL. So Eric. The injury looked bad. Can you give us any insight as far as anything else going on with that knee? Yeah, I mean, I think he did have some concomitant injury at the MCL as well. Um, and it's it's tricky because in the NFL, they don't have to report every detail. So there may have been more, you know, he may have gotten, you know, a small fracture in the tibia. He may have done something to the meniscus. You just won't find out possibly until months later. But, you know, he did suffer an ACL. It's about midway through the season. So... I mean, I guess the good news is that Jameis Winston isn't known for his rushing ability. Um, and that that will help him as a pocket passer. We've seen, you know, very immobile quarterbacks suffer ACL injuries and come back from them just fine. I think the tricky thing with Jameis is he doesn't have the starting gig locked down anywhere. And you really want to see at least 12 months of recovery for ACL injury. Um, and it's mid season, so he's not going to get that. He, you know, really could start week one next week or next year. Um, but ideally in terms of re-injury rates and full healing capacity, you want those full 12 months or more. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical on Jameis's outlook, but you know, it's, it's early, it's early in the process. I think more information will come out. Yeah, this week we saw Trevor Simeon, um, former Broncos legend, start after he went, or not start, come in after he left and take over for New Orleans. And he wasn't all that impressive. He's not somebody I'm looking at adding off of my waiver wire. And quite frankly, the only reason he played is because Taysom Hill hasn't played since week five with his concussion. Now, he's listed as questionable now, so that leads me to believe he's out of the concussion protocol. I could be wrong. I need to double check that before I go putting it out into the universe. But... If there's a New Orleans quarterback to pick up on waivers, it is Taysom Hill by far. Now, the fallout for that for me is to look at what happened to the weapons around him last season when he was the starter. Um, If I remember correctly, Michael Thomas wasn't the same Michael Thomas that he was with Drew Brees, which we would come to expect. We haven't even seen him on the field this year, so we don't know what to expect from him. But Alvin Kamara may see less around the goal line with Taysom Hill at quarterback. So tamper your expectations a little bit with Kamara, but he's really the best receiving threat that they have as well right now. So I'm still comfortable starting him. Keep going with the quarterback knee injuries, I guess. Matthew, Zach Wilson in New York. um, Eric said he's not out on him yet. He was out last week, and Mike White lit it up. I'm all for the Mike White hive, but what's Zach Wilson's outlook? When are the Jets going to get him back? Well, at the earliest, it won't be till next week because they have a Thursday night game this week. Coach has already said they've already announced Mike White as the starter, and Zach Wilson is still out. So if he starts practicing next week, then possibly week 10 – He's back in. I I believe the original timeline was two to four weeks. So it just makes it interesting with this knee injury on if Mike White goes out there and lights it up again Thursday night, what happens? 
because obviously they drafted Zach Wilson to be the future. Mike White's drafted, what, four years ago and never really got a shot anywhere and hasn't really done anything, but he threw for over 400 yards and three touchdowns in his first start of his career and looked a whole lot better than Zach Wilson has this year. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that. I, I wouldn't imagine Mike White overtakes their number two overall pick, but crazier things have happened in the NFL, like a six round QB going on to be the greatest of all time at the position. So yeah, we'll just have to see. You never know. I mean, if you picked up Mike White, I'm comfortable throwing him out there, but if you have, you know, if you have multiple options at QB this week, I might look elsewhere. I wouldn't expect 405 yards again. That's for sure. Although I did see that somebody put down a thousand dollar bet on Mike White before the week started to be the leading passer for the week and won like one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. I know that's that all they won. That's, that's, that's insane. insane. It, it might have been more than that. I don't know. It was a ton of money for Why putting down. Do that? I love it. Go big it or go worked. home. Can you imagine, though, going into Monday night, knowing you have Patrick Mahomes and Daniel Jones and it's like this could be a barn burner. Who knows, especially with Patrick Mahomes, that would be the one that makes me nervous. But you never know. Daniel Jones occasionally goes off for the bonkers game. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Just some quick hit and QB updates before we move on to the running backs. Russell Wilson had the pin removed from his broken finger this week. They do have a bye week this week. So he is expected to start practicing in week 10. And we could see him starting as early as week 10, week 11. So that's exciting if you are a DK Metcalf or Tyler Luckett manager. And then over in Washington, Ryan Fitzpatrick. So the last update I've been able to find was from October 25th. Um, they said that he was still on IR. They were going to redo his MRI in two weeks and see what would happen. Here we are just about two weeks out from that. I'm terrible at math. That's a, like a week. But anyways, here we are. We haven't heard anything else. No updates on like, oh, he seems to be moving better or anything. So it's kind of radio silent in Washington. If you have an IR spot and you don't have anybody else to throw in there and you not just want to have a depth stash later in the year sure but i mean taylor heineke's kind of got that spot locked up so i'm not too optimistic about ryan fitzpatrick returning anything else to add on qbs guys i think that no that pretty much covers it i think that sums it up all right speaking of tough running running backs that was an excellent segue thank you eric gosh just set me up just beautiful all right eric I'm going to you here. Miles Sanders in Philadelphia had an ankle injury missed last week. What's his outlook this week? Can we expect to see him back in the field? Is he out for a while? What's going on? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they put him on IR. Um, and that means that he'll be out for at least three weeks. I think it's also a pretty big indicator that they pulled Jordan Howard up and immediately gave him 12 carries for two touchdowns. I mean, you don't really do that for the guy that you have on your practice squad who's basically just a plotter. He'll get maybe 20 carries for 50 yards, that kind of thing. But, you know, I mean, Miles Sanders has a low ankle sprain. A lot of people are, you know, generally more concerned about the high ankle sprain variety like Jerry Judy had. But low ankle sprains can be pretty serious too. And, I mean, if you're given the comparison, you can look at other running backs in the league who have gotten low ankle sprains and, you know, they're out a week, maybe two, but they're never placed on IR. So, you know, the fact that he was placed on IR so soon, it's a pretty big indicator of the severity of that injury. You know, frankly, he may he may not be the Miles Sanders that you drafted him to be. Um, I'm not certain that he got the hype, you know, going coming into the season, you know, like he did last year, especially, but I'm not too certain about Miles Sanders future for the rest of the year. Yeah. He's one I kind of come into every year, cautiously optimistic. He seems to be one of those home run or meh kind of players week to week, and you never know which one you're going to get. And they usually run a committee in Philly. Anyways, with that being said, they, Ran a great committee last week. Boston Scott and Jordan Howard both had 12 carries. Both scored two touchdowns. They were fairly equal as far as runners. Boston Scott got the early game work. Um, the first few drives, it was just him. And then it kind of switched over and they started getting Jordan Howard and more. Out of those two, do you guys have a preference? I personally don't. I think Detroit is just terrible. And <laughs> that's it. They just turned around handing the ball off. And Detroit said, sure, we'll make these less than average players look like superstars here. 
yeah, if you picked one of those up on waivers last week and you have an opportunity to trade them high, do it. Do it now. But the dark horse, the uh, I guess dark horse isn't really the right word here. The kind of sleeper pick or the really deep league pickup is Kenneth Gainwell if he's not already on a roster. Most dynasty leagues, he's the ones I'm in anyways, he's already on rosters. But if you're in a deeper league and you really need a running back, he's an interesting one because he's getting the receiving work for them. Well, a lot of people were back. picking a lot yeah. of people were picking him up to play last week and yeah, I was looked a little weird on his usage but they were up so big maybe I mean, yeah it was there was, was no need to throw the ball and stuff strange that they didn't really use him but then again I mean like we said Boston Scott and um Jordan Howard kind of handled business there all right Chicago they're obviously without David Montgomery already Damian Williams went down with a left knee injury Matthew what's his outlook looking forward so there's not a whole lot of information out on this injury right now. Basically all the reports are still the reports from game day that said, yes, he's gone out with a, a knee injury. So I'm not really certain what's going on with his knee right now. Um, Cause as we've talked about, there's 30,000 different things that could, could be wrong with his knee depending on what it is. I mean, could be anything from just a bad bruise to a torn ACL. Now, I don't think it's a torn ACL because I feel like we would have heard something about that already. But it's kind of up in the air on what's going on with his knee, and he's just listed as questionable with a knee injury. Yeah, he was – I mean, he he did okay, but it really seemed to be like the Khalil Herbert show to me. He kind of took over and was the new starter there and – I'm not really looking back. I think Herbert's a starter until Montgomery comes back. He's certainly somebody I'm comfortable putting in the flex. And if I have to start him as an RB2, I'm happy to do that. They're using him and he's producing fairly well. But yeah, when Montgomery agree. when Montgomery comes back, I think they just go back to using him as the bell cow. I don't really see them going with a committee approach because they didn't in the past. Um, I think it'll just be back to the Montgomery show. Yeah, I agree. I think Montgomery goes back to that number one, and you're just happy that you've found Khalil Herbert to be that number number two in case of emergency guy. Yeah, he's certainly a fun DFS pickup the past couple of weeks. His price is probably going up, but it was a fun one while it lasted. All right, Eric, arguably the most surprising and upsetting injury of the week was Derrick Henry with his foot injury in Tennessee What's going on? When are we going to see him back on the field? Yeah, it's really a big bummer because, you know, Derrick Henry suffered a Jones fracture, which is a description of a pretty legitimate uh, bone fracture on the pinky toe side of his foot. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that if you don't rest it for enough time and just track its healing, then it may never re, you know, reform the way that you want it to. And this is a football team that obviously values Derrick Henry. So, you know, I think that there's no way that you see him for the remainder of fantasy football season. Um, I think that, you know, if the team is in position, if and if the bone is healing adequately, then they will try to put him in uh, for playoff, uh, playoff push. But, you know, I'm really not optimistic about, you know, his usage as a fantasy player uh, for the rest of this season. And, you know, it, it's the type of injury that, will respond to physical stress and that ground and pound. And Derrick Henry is a massive guy. So he's very naturally going to have much more stress on that foot, especially with the way that he runs. So, you know, I'm, I, if you're holding out hope, I would, you know, at least be making a, a legitimate plan B for the remainder of the year. Yeah. Jones fracture generally doesn't bode well for coming back quickly. It just kind of, as you described, it's an area it doesn't heal very well because there's poor blood flow to that area of the foot. Um, I read an article about this last year with Debo Samuel when he had one in the preseason and it was kind of one of those injuries where it's like it just held him back and held him back and held him back. And then when he finally came back, you could tell his conditioning was down because you can't run on it. The only thing you can do for treating it, I mean, there's the surgical options, which I believe he already had surgery or he was supposed to have it today. Um, They put a screw on the side of your foot and it runs towards your toes um, back into that bone to hold the end of it in place. But you just have to rest it because if you walk on it, you're just going to refracture and re-damage that site where they just did surgery. So even if he does come back, I wouldn't expect his conditioning to be up. I wouldn't expect the, you know, 25, 30 carries a week, Derrick Henry. 
Yeah, the next man up. Deal. Yeah, the next man up for them, it looks like might be Adrian Peterson. Um, they signed him to the practice squad. So I'm not sure that I'm all in on him yet. I'm not rushing to the waiver wire to spend a bunch of fab on him. Um, but Jeremy Jeremy McNichols has been the kind of the receiving back to compliment Derrick Henry. I'm curious if they work him in more. Uh, who do you guys prefer out of these two? I'd go Adrian Peterson, honestly. Yeah. I mean, he's the never aging running back. And I think that he fits their scheme way better than McNichols. We've seen McNichols in, you know, some action without Derrick Henry in the past. And he really acted more like a scat back, you know, kind of a Boston Scott type. So I, I think that they're going to really prefer Adrian Peterson. Yeah. See, this almost good. I'd go McNichols. I don't think 36 year old Adrian Peterson can just be plugged in and, like obviously he's not going to be Derrick Henry. You don't you don't get Derrick Henry back there. Yeah. Neither of these guys are going to be that. But I just don't think Adrian Peterson off the street when no team was looking to pick up him at all this year until their main guy got brought down. I think it was more just having a veteran that can learn the playbook that fast and kind of hit the holes and be all right. But I think personally, I think Jeremy McNichols is going to be the running back they're using. But I mean, I wouldn't place a bet on it, but yeah. Yeah, nothing reliable. I mean, their playbook for running back seems to be run the ball straight forward. I think Adrian Peterson can handle that, but I certainly, like you said, wouldn't expect Derrick Henry level production. And I don't think anybody picking him up is expecting that at all. Uh, moving on to San Francisco, Matthew, Elijah Mitchell. He's been a surprise out of the two rookie running backs i mean you probably would have told us that he was definitely the better one because i know you're not necessarily in love with trey sermon but although he's been surprising he's got a rib injury he's dealing with does this look like something that's going to hold him out to be fair i was not high on elijah mitchell either okay. but just to just to be I gave fair you a little to more myself, credit than was due i know <laughs> but i also wasn't expecting raheem Mostert to injure himself two plays into the season so but anyway injury. chips their <laughs> elijah mitchell he's dealing with a rib injury i'm basing this on the assumption that there's not a fracture in his ribs that will make things worse if he does play i'm assuming that it's just kind of bruised ribs and that it's a pain tolerance issue and for me if that is the case then i think he plays uh he's a rookie that's gotten the starting gig He's fighting for his life out there to keep that role and hopefully that role in the years moving forward. So I think he plays through it, assuming there's not a fracture that could possibly make things worse and lead to a punctured lung and stuff like that, where you'd rest him in that case. Yeah. If he's unable to go out of Jamichael Hasty and Trey Sermon, Eric, who do you prefer? Uh, I prefer Hasty. They've leaned on him a good bit before, and I mean, he doesn't look terrible. Um, I am really skeptical of their usage of Trey Sermon. Yeah, it's just been like a weird... It doesn't make sense if you're going to use the draft capital that they did on him. I know he wasn't a first round or anything, but they drafted him a lot higher than Mitchell, but I guess, you know, Mitchell's... He has. He's looked that much better. It's, why not play the hot hand? Why would you try to force something? Yeah, that's it a makes Brandon sense. Ayuk, Trent Sherfield issue, you know. Gosh, <laughs> flash in the pan that was. All righty, quick updates on some other running backs. James Robinson had a heel injury um, towards the end of the game this week. All the testing came back negative for him. They're expecting him to be okay to go. Um, Je- speaking of 49ers running backs, if you don't already have him stashed in an IR spot, Jeff Wilson's practice window opens up this week, which means that he will be eligible to return um, as long as he's able to participate in practice. And I really need to look up the rules so I know exactly what it is. But I believe it's if they participate in a full, they start practicing, they have to see game work within three weeks. And if not, the player automatically becomes a free agent, which is a new part of this uh, three-week short-term IR rule that's an interesting wrinkle. I don't know why you'd activate a player and practice them for three weeks and not give them you know, a snap. It's kind of weird but an interesting wrinkle. So if you see him practicing, expect to see him in the next three weeks. Um, Chris Carson in Seattle, Pete Carroll, ever optimistic, as we mentioned before, says that he should resume practicing in week 10 after suffering a neck injury. So keep an eye out for that. 
And last but not least, arguably the best running back in the league for fantasy purposes. Anyways, Christian McCaffrey, he is expected to begin practicing again on Wednesday and return from his hamstring injury. Moving on to the men on the outside, the wide receivers, Atlanta. So I just wanted to talk about this one real quick. Calvin Ridley has decided to take some time off from football for personal reasons. Um, I'm not going to speculate what it is because I don't know. It's a personal reason. Obviously, we can't go ask the guy and it's not really our place to. You know, we wish him the best. Hope he's getting his headspace right and getting everything right back at home and can get back to us soon. I get it. You know, sometimes you got to make yourself a priority. The next man up in Atlanta, though, somebody's got to step up in that office. Somebody's got to catch some passes. So I was very interested to see what Russell Gage could do when he came back this week. Luckily, I did not start him because he put up a goose egg, did not catch a ball didn't record any yards, nothing. I was like, interesting. I don't know if they were timid because he was just coming back from injury or if he didn't really get practice time in to build rapport back with Matt Ryan. What the deal was. Tajay Sharp was the leading receiver, but I think moving forward, it's just going to become the Kyle Pitts show. If you were high on Kyle Pitts coming into the season, get ready for your victory lap. I'm knocking on wood for you because I don't want to be the guy that cursed Kyle Pitts, but I'm very excited to see what he can do in the next couple of weeks until Ridley returns, if he does this season. Anyways, moving on from that, Matthew, the New York Giants wide receiver core, we've compared it to Baltimore's running back room and San Francisco's running back room because they can't seem to keep anybody healthy. Kenny Galladay and Sterling Shepard, they're both listed as questionable this week. What are we looking at from those two Yeah, I'm going to start with Sterling Shepard. He strained his quad. So if you're unaware, that's basically your front muscles on your thigh. And it looked quite painful when he went down. I highly doubt he's playing this week. I feel bad for the guy because he just constantly gets these nagging muscle injuries and then comes back and plays, comes back and plays. Now, the same can't be said for Kenny Galladay, who on October 11th, they were saying he was one to two weeks away from playing. And now we're into the month of November and we still have yet to see Kenny Galladay. So I don't really know what to make of Galladay. We kind of saw this last year with the, what was it, the hip issue? The same thing all over again. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know. If if he, I mean, I want to say, yes, he's truly dealing with something, or is he just one of those guys that he doesn't feel absolutely 100% then he doesn't want to be out there? And that's where I'm starting to be with him. And quite frankly, I don't, I mean, he's really not on any redraft rosters that in leagues I'm in because people have given up on him. And in the one dynasty league I have him in, I really regret having him in just because the guy never plays. Yeah, I'm getting the vibe. He's very much not a grinder. He's not somebody that wants to play through an injury. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at an X man up in this offense, I say it's Darius Slayton or Kadarius Tony. Flip a coin. They're both. They both have that big play ability. They're not somebody I'm starting expecting. You know eight receptions and 120 yards. If they get you big points, it's going to be because they scored a 50 yard touchdown. I'm there. I need a home run in the flex. They are not a weekly starter unless you're really short on options. In my opinion, on the other side of New York, Corey Davis has a hip injury. Eric, what's going on with him? Can we expect him back soon? Is this a long-term thing? It's sounding more short, medium term. Uh, Corey Davis has a hip flexor strain. And, you know, I, I think that the the head coach has already come out and said that it's not looking good for him to play, especially this Thursday night, I think it is. Um, it's tricky because, I mean, it's it's a soft tissue issue. And that essentially means that it needs rest. You know, he could, mean, he could need as many as three weeks rest. It really depends. And it stinks if you're a Corey, da- Corey Davis, you know, manager, because really it's the type of thing that, he could start to gain momentum and practice a little bit more. And by Friday, he put in a full practice. And then, you know, in pregame warmups, Sunday at 1230, he could tweak it and he could be out for the game. So he's going to be tough to rely on for the next couple of weeks. Um, 
I think the coach speaks says a lot, you know, it, it's not an optimistic verbiage. So I wouldn't expect to see Corey Davis this week and, and possibly not next week or the week after as well. Yeah. Yeah. If he doesn't get ruled out during the week, it feels like he's going to be one of those guys like Dak was this week where we're just kind of like watching, watching, watching. It's like, Oh, too yeah. late. If that's the case, if you're sitting there and you have him in your starting lineup and you're watching, 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 waiting, and you've got to have a guy to replace him in New York, for me, it's going to be Elijah Moore, um, either him or Braxton Berrios. For some reason, Braxton Berrios seems to be like the red zone guy for them. He's probably their smallest receiver, <laughs> but he's just like, he he gets open and he'll catch a four-yard touchdown. You'll get your, you know, six and a half points, but that's all you're expecting. So I'm kind of steering clear of this offense outside of Michael Carter, who's looked good lately. But I don't think you can really put a thumb on anybody and say, oh, yeah, this is going to be the receiver that you really want in New York. Am, am I wrong there? Do you guys have somebody that you're like, ah, oh, this is going to be the guy that benefits from it? No, and especially not when you're not too certain in the quarterback. I mean, yeah. you, you know, Mike White can't throw for 405 passes or 405 yards every game. Uh, more often than not, he probably That's will what you throw. Think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. He's going to set like eyes. a four week. He's <laughs> yeah. going to set like a four week passing yard record. Shoot, he might now that I've said that. Watch um, him put up six weeks like Dak did, or five weeks like Dak did last year to start the season. I hope he does. He's on my team. Wild. <laughs> Here for it. All right, Philadelphia. Jalen Rager was kind of starting to turn things around, Matthew, and then we saw him get carted off or carted to the locker room rather with an ankle injury. Is it as bad as it looked with the cart, or was that just a precautionary measure? Well, most likely just precautionary. People freak out a lot when they hear that the player was carted off, and it could mean something. It could not mean something. A lot of times they're just thinking, okay, there's enough here that we're worried about him putting pressure on it, so let's cart him back there and find out because they have x-ray machines in the back. Let's make sure he didn't fracture anything before we let him put any pressure on it or anything like that. So it definitely could just be kind of a cautious approach by them. Now, there hasn't been an update from the team about him yet either, which is a little little weird to say the least when an injury happens on Sunday and by Tuesday night we still haven't heard anything about the injury so that leads me to believe are they doing further testing like getting an mri on his ankle and stuff like that before they fully come out and say kind of exactly what we're dealing with or deciding whether to put him on ir and stuff going forward there's no telling we've seen it in the past with ankle sprains he could play this week or next week or he could wind up on IR and it's in four weeks that he's he's playing it's just hard to say at this point but there definitely is some concern for this ankle and the fact that we haven't heard anything yeah I think the next couple of days once we start getting practice reports and they have to put out mandatory injury reports we should get some more information hopefully you know for Rager and for Philly it's positive news but it's kind of looking bleak since we haven't heard anything in replacing him in Philly. I think Quez Watkins and rookie Devonte Smith get some more work. If you've got one of them, if you have to, I'd maybe flex some, but they're not guys that I'm really excited about. Not that R Rager really was, but he in deep leagues, you know, some weeks he's not a bad dart. However, the one guy, again, I'm going to bring him up is Kenneth Gainwell. I think he might see some additional receiving work with, Rager out. He's a quick guy. He can do a lot with the ball in space. Might be interesting to see what he can do. Get a little extra, you know, get a few extra targets. Speaking of guys that know what to do with the ball in space, Debo Samuel. We talked about him earlier when I was talking about Jones fractures. Here we go again with soft tissue injuries and Debo Samuel, Eric calf injury this week. What's, what's the deal? Yeah. I mean, Debo, he has a calf strain, and I'm usually a Debo pessimist with his injuries, but I'm actually conservatively optimistic about this one. Um, it, it seems like they're going to rest him, maybe give him partial practices and, you know, ideally obviously play on Sunday. I think that 
with his track record, there's enough there to say, you know, keep your ear to the ground, watch the practice reports, but everything that's coming out right now is actually pretty optimistic about this. Great. All right, real quick. If he's unable to go, is it Brandon Ayuk time? Do we trust him? He's had an upward trajectory for sure, especially with how uh, both Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch have been talking about him. Um, and, and his usage, his usage reflects that in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So I think that he'll have a fine, you know, trajectory towards the end of the season, but there's no way that you can trust him and definitely not on a week to week basis. No, he's a bi week filler or I have injuries. I got to start somebody. Plus he's got Jimmy G throwing him the ball again. So it gives me a little more confidence in him, but still don't trust him week to week. Antonio Brown, Matthew has a foot or ankle surgery. He was seen at practice on a bike with a walking boot on. What? What's the deal with that? So it's a little, you're kind of deciphering a lot of coach speak mm-hmm. with Antonio Brown. The coach says he has a sprain near his heel. Now that could mean a lot of different things. And you're also wondering if the coach is using the word sprain, right? because that typically means ligament injury. However, when a coach is talking about that, he might just say, yeah, he sprained his heel. And maybe it's more of a tendon strain towards the back of his heel with that Achilles tendon coming down. So it's a little hard to know exactly what's going on with him. Now, the bad news is this injury happened, what, a couple weeks ago? And he's still in a walking boot. I saw a report from today that they were like, Antonio Brown's riding the bike with the boot on. Which, when I read that headline, I was like, how the heck do you ride a bike with a walking boot? It's very, not (laughs) not the easiest thing to do. It's not one of the big ham walkers. Like, what the heck is this? (laughs) So, that's props to him for trying to keep his conditioning up. But it's definitely concerning to me that he is still walking around in a walking boot. Um, Does not bode well for this week, at the very least. And I guess we'll see going forward. Obviously, they didn't put him on IR, so they weren't thinking this is going to be at least a three-week injury, but maybe it kind of ends up being that. Yeah, Tampa has a bye week this week, so I'm not really looking – obviously not looking anywhere there for a next man up. I'm not too worried about it. We'll see if he's able to get healed up and get out of that boot and back on the bike without a boot uh, (laughs) during practice this week. Quick updates. Michael Gallup was said to be right around the corner for getting back to practice last week or getting back to game last week. Didn't end up playing. So I'm optimistic he should be back at practice, back playing this week and off of IR. And then for the Packers, Marquez Valdez-Scantling is set to return from IR this week. So Aaron Rodgers should be getting a little extra help there. And if Devontae Adams is still unable to clear the COVID um, protocols, then you might see him be a flexible player. All right, moving on to our last position group, the tight ends. Just a couple here. Robert Tanyan in Green Bay, speaking of Green Bay. Eric, he suffered what looked like a devastating knee injury. What can you tell us about him? Yeah, I'm pretty sure the reports came out and said it was an ACL. Really what this means for him is that he's going to be done probably into next season also. It's tougher for tight ends to recover and, and perform well after ACLs. Um, but he's young, you know, so he's got plenty of time. I think one of the tougher things is actually pretty contextual, which is probably the reality that both Aaron Rodgers and Devonta Adams, you know, are gone next year. Um, and that just leaves a lot of uncertainty for, you know, who's going to be throwing in the ball, who's the primary target in Green Bay. There's just a lot of question marks that are added now, um, now that he has this injury and you have to punt until next year. So, you know, I, his outlook is, is questionable to me. Um, I'm kind of medium on him. I think, you know, his, his productive season, he was just force fed touchdowns from one of the greatest quarterbacks, you know, in the world. So, you know, it's unfortunate, but he'll, he has plenty of time to come back. Yeah, backing him up at tight end is Mercedes Lewis, who he he can catch the ball, but he's definitely more known for his blocking abilities. If there's anybody that benefits from it, I think it may be A.J. Dillon. And I know it kind of sounds weird, but hear me out. Like, if we're force-feeding Robert Tanyan touchdowns in the red zone, why not just plow gigantic thighed A.J. Dillon into the back of your offensive line and hope he can bust into the end zone? 
I don't know. I don't think there's really much to be excited about at the tight end position outside of the few elite guys. So I'm not certainly not looking at Mercedes Lewis as somebody I want to start every week. Speaking of elite tight end options, Darren Waller is dealing with an ankle injury. Matthew, what's his outlook? So Darren Waller with his ankle, he was supposedly close to being able to play week seven. And then they had a bye week eight. So I have to imagine that means he's ready to play now. Keep an eye on the practice report. I fully imagine Darren Waller's going to play. Yeah, he should be back. If he's not, I think the next man up for them is going to be Brian Edwards. Um, if you didn't hear the news today about Henry Ruggs, some really sad news. It was reported that he was arrested after a DUI in which he was in an accident with a fatality. Um, I believe he's being charged with a death caused while drinking on or driving under the influence rather um, super sad stuff all the way around. Obviously our thoughts and prayers go out to the family, to Henry Ruggs family. It's just a sad situation all the way around. I'm not going to speculate on if he'll be back or when he'll be back or anything, but I yeah, don't drink and drive people. If you drank, like get an Uber, call your grandma, call somebody like not worth it. This is the kind of stuff that sadly can happen. It's just not worth ruining lives. Yeah. There's no excuse for the normal person. There's definitely no excuse for an NFL millionaire that I believe I also saw somewhere that the NFL reimburses players for Uber rides <laughs> too. I don't know if that's a hundred percent accurate, but even if he could probably afford to you have the millions of dollars, you home. should be able. To. Yeah, exactly. Heinous. All right. Reel it back in after a sad note. All right. Updates. Otherwise at the tight end position, Dawson Knox, who had a fracture in his hand, had surgery to pair it is listed as day to day. I don't really trust him yet until he gets in a full practice, but if he's able to get in a full practice, I'm fine with throwing him back in the starting position. He was great before his injury. I don't think this is anything that's going to hold him back long term if he's able to get back so quickly. And then again, with the practice window, George Kittle's practice window opens this week. So if you see him practicing, he is definitely going to be playing in the next three weeks because San Francisco will not let that guy just randomly become a free agent. And also of note, Noah Fant was added to the COVID list yes. yes he was i so saw that today as well just and keep an eye out on that yeah thank you i didn't get Albert to add that oh i didn't get to add that to our show doc so i appreciate you adding that in this is the moment that albert O takes the starting gig it's and runs the moment with it. you've all been waiting for and by you all i mean matthew all righty you gentlemen ready for some trivia let's do this let's get it cue the music Alrighty, this week's Sunday night football matchup, or last week's Sunday night football matchup, rather, fell on the night of Halloween. Historically, the NFL had some pretty memorable Halloween games, including a 94 matchup between the Packers and Bears, which saw temperatures in the 30s, wind gusts of up to 50 miles per hour, and a 1988 matchup between the Colts and Broncos, in which Eric Dickerson rushed for over 150 yards and four touchdowns. One of the best fantasy games ever. So this week's Sunday night football game featured the Dallas Cowboys and the Minnesota Vikings. And in honor of a matchup of two of the best backfields in the league, can you guys name the running back from one of these two teams, the Dallas Cowboys or the Minnesota Vikings, who holds the single game rushing record? Oh, I feel like this is a trick question. Name. Don't forget to type it in the chat for me. I'll read it out loud. Wait. Name the running back from either Dallas or Minnesota who holds the NFL's single game rushing record. Is this a trick question? Now, can I oh, offer sorry. some clarity on the situation? Yeah, you, can ask, you can say, no, I'm not going to answer if you want. All right. Do you mean the running back that did he play for both or there was a running no, back no, from one both? Or the other. That, one or the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. He played for one of these teams at the time in which the record was set. Do we get bonus points if we name both? There will be plenty of bonus points, but no, it's the single game. The NFL's single game rushing record is held by a player from one of these two teams. Who is it? Okay. 
I'm ready to. I have it in the chat. I'm ready Three, to press. Two, one. Ooh. Ooh, the Nighthawk, you are incorrect, sir. Damn it. I almost put Herschel Walker. <laughs> I almost put Adrian Peterson. I deleted it. <laughs> Fantasy Fair, you are correct. It was it. Adrian Peterson. It. He rushed for 296 <laughs> yards. Ah, good job. The, the Herschel now, Walker is why I asked for it. <laughs> yeah. It was the San Diego Chargers were the opponent, and this happened in 2007. All right. Since I didn't get you guys any treats for Halloween, I've got another little bonus question to sprinkle in here. Since we talked about the Cowboys as well, who holds the Cowboys single game rushing record? And it is not Herschel Walker. I'll give you that. I'm ready. All right. Hold on. I'm thinking. Ooh, quick decision. How do I know this better than you? Uh, <laughs> I forgot Matthew was a Cowboys fan when yeah, I made this. I was like, what the freak? Because I don't think oh, it's Matthew. as easy as you think it is. They have had a lot of very good running backs. Yeah, they have, they have. Yeah, Twitter would tell you that Tony Pollard's the best of them. It's not Tony Pollard. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Three, All two, right. one. Ooh. Oh, the Nighthawk blanks this week. Damn and, it. Uh, Matthew got them both. It is no. DeMarco Murray. Good job. I told against, you it wasn't as easy as you thought it was. Against the Rams in 2011. Team, advantage. DeMarco Murray rushed for 253 yards. And a fun fact about both of these events, both AP in 2007 and DeMarco Murray in 2011, they were both rookies when they set these records. So they both went over 250 yards as rookies. That is wow, insane. All right, good job. Maybe we'll see Trey Sermon rush for 250A, Matthew? Yeah. Probably not. All righty, guys. Let's for close this his thing career? out. career? Yeah. <laughs> I'll take the under. Um, Matthew, <laughs> Matthew, let's get started with some social media handles and close this thing out. Where can we find you, sir? You can find me at Fantasy Ferret on Twitter. That's where I spend most of my time for fantasy football. All righty. And Eric, where can we find All you right. on Twitter, sir? I am the Nighthawk PT. You can find me on Twitter at FF underscore Nighthawk. All righty. And I am your host, Kyle Allen. You can find me on Twitter at Allen underscore four. We need to give a big shout out to John C. Music at gmail.com for making all of our intro and outro music and playing these sweet tunes for us. Once again, thank you to everybody that tuned in to our live show tonight. And for those that are listening afterwards, we appreciate you as well. Best of luck in your matchups this week. Keep an eye on the practice reports. And don't forget, the best ability is availability. Peace. See you later. Adios. And go Braves. <laughs>